Ale Alexander, it's wild how you opened with your keynote talking about the two Hopi paths. Because I stand before you as someone who has just changed paths. I came from the technology world. I'm very proud of everything I've done in tech. I'll tell you a little bit about it in a minute. But I am here now transforming and taking another path. Um, there's a lot of good that high technology has brought to us, but as Alexander uh, was pointing out, there's also a lot of things about technology that have contributed to us losing our way, basically. So I'm pleased that I've been able to make this change for myself, and I'm going to tell you uh, other reasons why in a minute. So a little about me. I have been working in immersive technology, that's 3D graphics, uh, virtual and augmented reality, for almost 30 years. I wrote some of the earliest code in the metaverse, for the metaverse, back in the mid-1990s. Believe it or not, it's been around that long, yes. Now, of course, it was very, very early. Um, we didn't have supercomputers in our pockets in the forms of cell phones. We certainly didn't have consumer-grade virtual reality, like an Oculus that we can put on our head now, like the wonderful art that uh, Robbie makes and all that. And now we do. So we've been on a journey, and it's taken a while. Um, for me, it was always informed by a vision of empowering creators to make virtual worlds. This is when the internet was just getting going. I was working on tools to give people ways to make immersive places and then connect them online on the internet. <clears throat> I created a technology called VRML, the Virtual Reality Modeling Language, back in the mid-1990s. 3D graphics you could see in your web browser. That was definitely pretty visionary, as uh, Ray was saying. I didn't know any better. I was just a st stupid young kid who wanted to work on some tech. Um, more recently, I've created something called GLTF. I don't know if you've heard of it, but if you're a content creator doing 3D, it's basically the way you can experience 3D models on the internet. So I actually came full circle, and that was in the last decade or so, created this wonderful 3D technology. So I've done all this really notable stuff in tech. But as Ray pointed out, I'm also a musician. I'm actually a lifelong musician. I've had an instrument, an instrument in my hand since I could walk. My father was a performing musician. Wildly, my son is a musician as well. So I guess there's something in the DNA. And I put all of that on the back burner for years. But a while ago, um, about, how long ago was it? About 15 years ago, I completed writing a musical. It's a musical called Judgment Day. It's about love and the end of the world. Boy meets girl, boy gets girl, boy loses girl because a malign entity known as the One comes to Earth, seduces us all, and then enslaves us. And the world is ultimately destroyed in a cosmic battle between good and evil and curtain. It's a banger, it's a rock musical, it's like uh, the Who's Tommy, meets the book of the Revelation, Christian book of the Revelation. And it's wonderful, and I didn't do anything with it for over a decade. And then I realized friends started shaming me, and I don't know, Donald Trump, and a whole bunch of stuff was happening. It was like, Jesus Christ, the world's gonna actually end. I better get this musical out. And so I started recording the cast recording, uh, the concept album, and um, then I was trying to figure out, how am I gonna distribute this thing? I guess I'm gonna put it on the streaming services. I guess I'm gonna to have to figure out how to pay to get even, pay even more than it costs to make the record to get people to listen to my music. And I thought there is something wrong there. i had been investigating NFTs for you know, visual art for a while and that's when I discovered people making music NFTs. And I realized, wow, this is maybe a way that I could get Judgment Day uh, released, paid for, maybe pay myself back all the money I spent to make the record, and then some. So I have now launched the Judgment Day collection with beautiful visual art, actually, from my wife, life partner, Marina Berlin. Say hi, Marina. Um, <laughs> And it's a wonderful collection. It's a thousand music NFTs. We sold the first hundred. We did it. We're dropping them kind of in batches of songs. And we've sold out the first hundred. Uh, the fun part of the visuals is it's an oracle deck. It's like a tarot deck. So collectors are also getting a little divination tool. And we're actually doing live readings on Twitter spaces. You heard these musicians talk about this. So this is great. I never would have thought about doing this if it hadn't been for the tools of Web3 and the success that we have seen among these dear friends, I've I, I become best friends with all these folks um, that were up here on the panel, 
uh, because I've been in those Twitter spaces with them. We have laughed together. We have cried together. We have forged relationships online for a year and a half, two years, and now we're all meeting in real life, and it's been wonderful. And, you know, that, again, as Ray said, you know, this is not about replacing real life. This is about enhancing it, and it's about bringing all these tools together. So, lucky me, this is great. I just wanted to tell you a little bit about myself, but really... I consider what I'm doing part of a larger movement and uh, change that's afoot in the world. And that's you know, really why we're here and why you know, Santa Fe NFT exists. This is just such a magical place to do this talk, Jeff. Thank you so much. Um, I think there's some real trends going on here. And, and the panelists, I think they touched on them a little bit, but let me just summarize that and then we can get onto the music and listen to everyone's amazing performances. There's some trends happening in the industry in general. There's kind of a revolution going on among creators right now. And um, we were talking about writer strikes earlier, the, you know, the SAG strike. Creators are up in arms across arts and entertainment. And tools like the tools of Web3, I think, are going to help empower them in lots of ways. And this creator revolution really is these three trends. The first is communities are the new scale. If you think about how Silicon Valley operates, how big tech operates, Businesses have to have a billion users, you know, at least a couple hundred million subscribers to then have, you know, crappy little subscription fee or sell ads, right? That's not what's happening now. What you heard these musicians talk about is we get online, we do live audio, we play our songs for our fans in these spaces and they buy our NFTs. And guess what? When you do it that way, you can sell direct to them. Nessie said it, you can buy one of my songs for a hundred bucks. Um, these numbers add up really, really quickly. Contrast that with, I'm gonna give you guys two numbers right now. One million and 3,000. Does anyone know what those numbers mean? Okay, on Spotify, if you have a million streams, you, the artist, get $3,000. Um, Snoop Dogg was famously talking about this in a panel, actually, where he was being asked about the uh, writer's strike back in the spring. And he was like, where the fuck is the money? Um, I have a billion streams, and I don't make a million dollars. It just doesn't add up. So... Those business models do not support artists making money. And the take rates of platforms like that and streaming are really bad. But even, you know, if you're selling interactive content or anything, you know, these marketplaces, the app stores, all that, they take way too much. So now we have an opportunity with building community relationships one-on-one, -on -one, knowing all your fans, where, you know, the diehards, they spend a few hundred bucks on you a year, a few thousand of them, you're making a living as an artist. So that's the first big trend I see. Uh, the second is, we're really seeing a shift from platforms, platform tech, to tools. This is no longer about one piece of technology infrastructure, let's say, you know, Instagram, Meta, whatever, um, controlling the entire stack. Now with Web3, we can create our own experiences, we can deliver them direct to our fans, and we don't have to go through this platform that's taking all this. So there's a real movement to using the technology the way it was, should have been in the first place, which is a tool that helps us do our job, potentially reach our audience, eventually make money. Um, and these platforms are all built on interoperable tech. So like the 3D that I created with GLTF, you can make a 3D model, you can make a 3D experience, and it's not, it can be run anywhere. And the same with the NFTs, that's uh, the smart contract code, is code that runs on the public Ethereum blockchain, and it runs everywhere. And so it's not controlled by any one company, so that's huge. And then I think the third trend, and it's the most important one, and they touched on a little bit in our panel earlier, uh, the music panel, is all of these artists are becoming their own entrepreneurs, they are hyphenates, they're doing everything. They're project managers, they're marketers, they're producers, they're doing it all. Um, a lot of it's because they have to. Indie artists really have to do that. You know, you have to hustle. Um, but, you know, Sam, you were talking about um, it is expensive to make a record. It's a lot cheaper than it was 20 years ago. The tools, you know, the prices of everything have come down. So it's not exactly trivial. And, you know, you can be in your kitchen. You can be Grimes and her brother, whatever. And, and I'm sorry, yeah, Billy Eilish and her brother. Um, and, you know, do your own thing. But not everyone can do that. You still have to pay for studio time. But it's not the same economics as it used to be. So now, and especially with digital natives who can use all the digital tools to market and everything, basically people way younger than me, anyone under 40, you know how to use these tools. So you can run your own business now. 
So artists are becoming their own CEOs, and not every artist is comfortable with that, and they don't want to do the numbers and all that. But more and more, we're seeing this indie artists are doing it, and they're thriving. So this is great. So these three trends are all adding up to art artists taking the power back. And it's happening in music first, because look what, what happened with music. Napster, file sharing, just basically people were stealing music. Then with these streaming services, I ran the numbers for you. It's just horrible. And so then artists were getting conditioned. They have to go out and tour. And you know, Ray was talking about touring earlier and how people were maligning it. I think there's a context there which is more like artists got conditioned that they have to tour and sell t-shirts because their music has to be given away. So, I, you know, I'm going to talk about that more in a second, but it's definitely fundamentally changing now, which is awesome. And I think that change is happening in every art form, everywhere in entertainment, uh, again, with music first. So what does this mean for all of us? I just want to have like two more takeaways here I want to cover. I think the first is that fundamentally, we need to make a shift in how we value art. In a particular music, we were, we were seeing that. Whoever said a song should cost a dollar? Like, a song should be 99 cents. Well, Apple, yeah, exactly. Thank you, Alexander, but yes. Um, that's less than the price of a cup of coffee. Now, I love a good cup of coffee, but let's face it, what happens with a cup of, cup of coffee? It goes in one end and out the other in about an hour, right? So, I mean, a song? A song's forever. We really need to think about this differently. And you know, these folks, have, they've covered like, what it costs to make a song, what it costs to maintain your career. We have to get back to valuing the art so that these folks can keep making more of it and bring that into our lives. And the other big thing is we need, and I think Christian had to leave it, but props to him, we need to start thinking about these things as ecosystems. This is, art, art is not a commodity. I mean, we treat it that way. We treat it like a thing, like an object. We have to think much more like this is an ecosystem. It is an exchange of value. It is a flow. And it includes not just the artist and the person who's enjoying it, not the consumer, if you will, but you know, the gallery it's experienced in. Every step of the way, everything is a system of flow, an exchange of value, not a thing you buy and then you just stick on the shelf. Yeah, that's an artifact, and that's, that's cool, and the collectibles are great. But we need to think about this much more from that standpoint, that we're all in a living ecosystem system together, making each other's lives better. And so I hope with that, we can go forth and do that. This is a creative revolution that I am so privileged and humbled to be part of. And we should all be partners in this. And thank you, Santa Fe. And God bless you all. This is a great moment. Thanks for listening. Let's get on to the music. Thank you. <laughs>